There are numerous instances where facilities originally intended to provide care and support have instead become places of darkness and suffering. In the capital of Russia, such a place exists a building designed to be one of the country's leading medical facilities, but destined to become a source of misery. Join us as we delve into the dark past of Gavrina Hospital. When the doors leading from the street outside to the front office opened, the duty sergeant didn't even look up from his newspaper. The sensors above the entrance were so sensitive they were often triggered by passing cars, rather than people. It wasn't until he heard a low cough that he lowered the paper to see an elderly woman standing there, cautiously regarding him. In a blunt tone, the officer asked the woman why she was there at such a late hour, adding that for her sake it had better be important. Her nervous reply was that she came seeking help, looking for a policeman to assist in finding her missing dog. The sergeant, making no effort to hide his irritation, told her that all his officers were busy dealing with real crimes and advised her to seek help from friends or family. Undeterred, the visitor replied that she had no one else to turn to, and even if she did, no one would accompany her into the nearby derelict Gavarina Hospital. At the mention of the abandoned building, the sergeant's eyes narrowed. Folding the newspaper, he leaned forward and said that under no circumstances should anyone enter that place. If her dog had strayed there, it was almost certainly dead, and that should be the end of it. But the elderly woman was not dissuaded. She continued to appeal for help, only leaving when threatened with arrest for wasting police time. As she shuffled out into the street, the officer shook his head in frustration. The sooner the city authorities demolished that place, the better, as all it had generated for the local police was an unending saga of violent and unspeakable crimes. It wasn't until a week later that the desk sergeant learned the fate of his unwanted visitor. Despite his warnings, she had gone off in search of her missing pet alone, only to be discovered later in horrifying and mystifying circumstances. In the 1970s, Moscow authorities approved the construction of a modernized medical facility, aiming to improve the city's inadequate healthcare services. The new hospital was to be located in the northern Pavrina district, near the Lykoborka River. From the outset, there was speculation that the project's ambition had outstripped its budget, which was deemed insufficient to complete the 10-story building designed to hold up to 1,300 patients. Concerns arose when closer inspection of the construction site revealed it was a wetland, posing a significant risk of flooding and subsidence. Despite this, the planners pushed forward, and by the summer of 1980, construction had commenced. Neighbors watched as the massive hospital rose, constructed around a three-raid star plan with brutalist architecture. The building resembled something out of a science fiction or horror movie. After two years of work, the outer shell of the building was completed, but construction suddenly halted. At public meetings, questions arose about how the funds had been spent. It was revealed that the site was previously a graveyard closed and covered by authorities in the late 1960s. This led to constant flooding in the building's basement, draining the budget and ultimately bankrupting the project. Despite repeated appeals for additional funding, work never resumed, and for the next 36 years, the hospital stood dormant, never treating a single patient. Over time, the derelict hospital became a magnet for explorers, and calls to local police increased as the building's internal structure deteriorated. Drunks and vagrants who sought shelter inside were found dead, and the bodies of murder victims were occasionally discovered, raising concerns about possible serial killings. In 1985, the community was shaken by the discovery of another body at the hospital, the elderly woman who had gone missing after searching for her dog. A group of boys exploring the basement found her body floating in a flooded crater. Her legs and back were broken, as if she had fallen from a great height. 
Yet, the room where she was found was fully enclosed, making it impossible for her to have fallen there on her own. In 2005, the Moscow police were called to the site again, this time to search for a missing 16-year-old named Alexei Krishkin, who had left a suicide note at home. Alexei was known to frequent the derelict hospital and his belongings were found on the eighth floor, near an open elevator shaft. Officers assumed his body would be at the bottom, but after searching, they found nothing. Hours later, Alexei's remains were discovered in a second floor room, his body showing catastrophic injuries consistent with a severe fall. Yet again, how his body was relocated to the enclosed room remained a mystery. Reports of paranormal activity soon followed. Teens exploring the building claimed to have seen a glowing entity resembling a tall, slender male near the eighth floor elevator shaft or in the room where Alexei had been found. The figure seemed aware of its observers and would pass through walls before disappearing. In 2006, rumors circulated about three teens found slain at the site followed by the discovery of a twisted and broken explorer at the bottom of an elevator shaft in 2011. The exact number of people who died at Govrina Hospital remains unknown, as city authorities have refused to release official figures or comment on the site's haunting history. One of the darkest stories linked to the hospital involves a group known as Namasta, an occult sect believed to have used the building for satanic rituals during the 1990s. After pressure from locals, authorities sent a police unit to stop the cult. Allegedly, officers stormed the building, herding the cult members into the basement and killing them. Their bodies remain hidden beneath the floodwaters to this day. The site was finally sold to a private company in 2018. In October of that year, the hospital structure was demolished erasing all traces of its sinister and mysterious past. Story 2 I've always loved abandoned places. There's just something exhilarating about walking through a place no one is supposed to go. It tells stories of a time long past. Maybe it's the silence or the sense of isolation that comes with being in a place the world has forgotten. I'm not really sure, but there's something special about it. Blackwood Hospital, though, that place was different. I first heard about it from a few guys on an urban exploration forum I frequent. Sometimes it's good to keep in touch with the community. There were whispers, rumors about it being one of the most haunted places in the country, let alone the city. The hospital had been closed for over 50 years shut down after some sort of scandal that no one seemed to know the full details of. Some said it was because of malpractice, others whispered about the insane experiments conducted on the patients there. Either way, it had been locked up tight ever since. No one had managed or dared to breach it yet. It had become kind of a myth in its own right on the forum. All sorts of rumors flew around, people saying that the last ones who had gone there hadn't come back out. That there was a ghost in there who roamed the empty halls, and even the occasional blood-curdling scream that could be heard at night from outside the gates. I didn't buy into it, at least not entirely. Places like this always had ghost stories attached to them, but the prospect of getting in there where no one had explored yet that was too good to pass up. I spent weeks planning. The place was guarded pretty heavily. The city had a vested interest in keeping people out. The new mayor was all about safety and security. They must have heard about the increasing fame of the building. Thankfully, I found a gap in the patrols and figured out how to get over the fence. I even scoped out an entrance, a basement window that had been smashed open by some delinquent years ago. Everything was ready. I waited until a moonless night, figuring my best shot was to move under cover of complete darkness. Armed with my flashlight, a camera, and my phone, 
I scaled the fence at the perfect moment and dropped silently onto the other side. The hospital loomed before me. It felt almost menacing. It was huge, much bigger than I had imagined. You can see pictures of things on the internet, but it can never get across just how big some things are. The building sprawled across several acres, and from where I stood, I could make out the skeletal remains of multiple wings and crumbling structures. Vines crawled up the stone walls, and shattered windows stared back at me. I hesitated for a moment. I had explored big places before, but none like this. Something about it felt different. I shook off the feeling before long and moved toward the basement window I had found during my earlier scouting trips. It took a little effort, but I managed to pull myself carefully through the jagged opening, landing on the cold, tiled floor below. The air was thick with the scent of mold and dust, stale from decades of disuse. I cursed myself for not thinking to bring a face mask with me. I hoped that would be the worst of my problems. The basement was a maze of utility rooms, old storage areas, and dark, damp hallways. Most of the equipment had been stripped away over the years, but the occasional rusted stretcher or broken wheelchair remained, long forgotten. It didn't take long before I felt utterly disoriented. The place seemed to stretch on forever, and the deeper I went, the more I began to feel trapped. As I continued walking through a narrow corridor, I was careful to avoid the broken glass scattered on the floor as much as possible. The crunching of my feet echoed off the walls. I was just about to cross the threshold into a larger room at the end of the hallway when I heard a piercing squeaking noise fill the air. Reflexively, I spun around on the ball of my foot to look behind me. It looked identical, although I wasn't sure that a rusted wheelchair I had stepped past a moment ago wasn't in the same position. After staying frozen for a few seconds, I didn't see or hear anything. Just my imagination playing tricks on me, I thought, and I continued on. I eventually found a staircase leading up. The metal steps creaked beneath my weight as I ascended and I emerged into what looked like the main hospital building. The difference between the basement and the upper floors was striking. Here the decay was more apparent. The paint on the walls was peeling in long strips, and there were huge holes in the plaster. Broken windows let in a chill from outside, along with the rhythmic patter of the heavy rain. I walked slowly, taking it all in, snapping a few pictures with my phone. The silence was striking. Every sound I made seemed to reverberate unnaturally, as if the walls were amplifying the smallest noise. After a short while of walking around in awe, I found what appeared to be an old nurse's station, with overturned chairs and scattered papers littering the floor. There was a thick layer of dust on everything, clearly untouched by human hands for years. It was amazing to see a place that just used paper there weren't any computers at all. Curiosity got the better of me, and I picked up a few papers from the floor to look at. I shone my flashlight on them and scanned through, but to my disappointment, there was nothing that interesting. Just drug dosage and doctor's notes. They must have used a typewriter to produce these the typeface was pleasingly retro. Just as I was coming to the end of the last note, something clattered onto the floor behind me. A pen rolled slowly between my feet. That's odd, I thought. It must have fallen off the nurse's station, but I hadn't touched the station at all. Again, I brushed the thought off quickly. As I crouched to pick up the pen, I felt a draft run along the floor. To be expected, considering the number of broken windows in the place. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end as I straightened up, turning the pen over in my hand. It wasn't just any pen, it was pristine, clean, like it had just been dropped minutes ago. That was impossible. The room was covered in dust, it clearly hadn't been touched for years. I stood frozen for a moment, staring at the pen. 
Then, the silence around me was broken by a faint noise. A soft scraping sound, like something being dragged across the floor. My eyes opened wide. Slowly I turned towards the source of the sound. Down the hallway, barely visible in the weak light of my flashlight, something moved in the shadows. I couldn't quite make it out. Was it an animal? Might be a fox looking for food, although it would find nothing here. As I strained my eyes to see, I saw something that didn't seem to make sense. The object was solid but seemed darker than the shadows around it, and it was getting closer. I instinctively stepped backward, nearly tripping over my own feet. The shadow continued to move, and now I could hear it more clearly. Slow, deliberate footsteps, and the soft drag of something heavy along the floor. I ducked down behind the nurse's station, hoping that they hadn't seen me. Someone must have had the same idea as me. Just my luck for this to happen. I waited with bated breath to see if they were heading in my direction, but the footsteps didn't stop. They grew louder. Panic set in. I didn't dare move. One other thought popped into my head, could it be the police? Possible. I didn't want to stick around to find out. The footsteps stopped abruptly and the silence returned. This silence had a weight to it, though. I couldn't hear the rain anymore, couldn't even hear my own breathing. It was like the world around me had gone still, like time itself had paused. And then, from the end of the hallway, a voice. It was soft at first, barely a whisper, but it sent a jolt of fear through my entire body. Help me. The words echoed, bouncing off the walls, growing louder with each repetition. Help me, I backed up, nearly tripping over a fallen chair as I tried to put distance between myself and whatever was down the hallway. My flashlight flickered again, plunging me into momentary darkness, and in that split second, I heard it a loud metallic crash, like something slamming into the wall. The light managed to flicker back on, and I saw it. A figure stood at the far end of the hallway, partially obscured by shadow. It was hunched over, its limbs long and twisted, its head cocked at an unnatural angle. The gown it wore was filthy, covered in dark stains that looked like dried blood, and then it moved not walking, but jerking forward in quick, unnatural bursts, like its body was being pulled by invisible strings. Each movement was accompanied by a sickening crack, the sound of bones snapping and joints popping. Help me, the voice said again, but this time it was right next to me. I screamed. Then, as if my legs were acting independently of me, I turned and ran. I sprinted down the hallway, the flashlight beam bobbing violently as I fled. I darted around a corner, slamming into the wall, but I didn't stop. I had to get out of here. My mind raced, trying to remember the way back to the basement, to the window eye. I had crawled through. But the hallways all looked the same now, a twisting maze of decay and darkness. Behind me, I could hear the dragging noise again, followed by more footsteps. Closer this time, too close. I nearly tripped down the stairs, catching myself on the rusted handrail. The moment my feet hit the basement floor, I ran. My flashlight flickered again, and I cursed under my breath. The air felt thicker down here, oppressive, as if the walls were closing in. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears, my breaths coming in ragged gasps. I reached the window my escape route and didn't hesitate. I scrambled through the opening, feeling the jagged glass cut into my hand as I pulled myself out. The rain was still pouring outside, but it felt like a relief compared to the suffocating atmosphere inside the hospital. I hit the ground running, not looking back. I didn't stop until I was far away, until the hospital was just a distant silhouette against the dark sky. Only then did I collapse against a tree, gasping for breath. 
What had I just seen? What had I just heard? I couldn't explain it, and I didn't want to. All I knew was that I wasn't going back. Not ever. Blackwood Hospital could keep its secrets. Is it me, or is it unusually slow tonight, my coworker asked. We all looked at each other and agreed. We worked in a very small hospital emergency room. There were seven of us on that night, one doctor, four nurses, and two R techs. The hospital had no inpatient wards like an ICU, so no one stayed overnight. It was just us in the entire hospital. If patients needed to be admitted or required emergency surgery, we had paramedics on standby, ready to drive patients about an hour away to a larger hospital system. They usually stayed in their ambulances, sleeping. We had in-house radiology, lab services, and one housekeeper, which made everything convenient. The janitor would be somewhere in the hospital, cleaning and preparing the place for the next day. The clock hit 2 a.m., and I thought to myself, five more hours. It wasn't that I was tired, but the silence and boredom, combined with my sleeping co-workers, made it difficult to stay awake. The housekeeper on duty that night was Dua. Dua was mute and deaf, which sometimes made her job more challenging. They said she used to speak, but something happened long ago that caused her to stop. Most of us learned some basic ASL to communicate with her, with phrases like hello. And how are you along with some work-specific signs? She was so sweet and almost always brought us food. Tonight, she brought lumpia and chicken noodles with her homemade sweet chili sauce. She always made much more than we could eat, but we were grateful. She was like a mama bear to us. Hello, she signed to me. Hello, I signed back. How are you? Good, she signed with that sweet smile of hers. She took out her notepad and wrote, help. I smiled back and nodded. Dua often asked us to go down into the basement with her, where the laundry area was. I think she liked the company. I can imagine how hard it must be to work solo every night. Dua grabbed the bedding storage, and we started rolling it out of the ER and down the hall. The hallways would be dark at night, but as we walked, each segment would activate the lights with our movement. We had two elevators in the hallway, but only one went to the basement which was on the other end of the building. Do a motion for me to push solo, and she took out her notepad and wrote, Busy. I shook my head and made a dozing off face, wondering if she ever got offended by our facial expressions. I motioned for her to push solo, and we switched roles. I wrote, It's been a struggle staying awake. I'm sure you saw everyone falling asleep, she grinned and nodded. We arrived at the elevator, and on the way down, the lights flickered. It didn't happen often, but when it did, my heart always skipped a beat, imagining the elevator getting stuck. I couldn't fathom being trapped in a building from the 1920s with all my co-workers sleeping on the other side. I pulled out my cell phone, no service, of course. The elevator doors opened, and we made our way to the laundry area. The basement was old, with exposed brick walls and a long, dim hallway leading to several rooms. There were different operations in the basement, the laundry room, the sterilization room, and an old morgue that hadn't been used in decades. We used to have an operational ICU and surgical suite, but budget cuts closed them down, and everything now gets passed off to the city. As we passed by the morgue, I thought I saw something red out of the corner of my eye. I paused briefly but saw nothing when I looked again. Dua caught my eye with a concerned expression. What she signed. I shook my head and smiled, making the crazy sign by rolling my finger at my temple. Her expression remained a mix of concern and borderline fear, making me feel guilty for spooking her. In the laundry room, Dua turned on an old boombox, filling the room with a pop song. 
The techno beats and robotic voice of the singer seemed so out of place, but it helped pass the time. I offered to help do well with her tasks, but she grabbed my arm and motioned that she didn't want my help. I nodded and sat down in a chair, fighting the urge to doze off. Feeling thirsty, I stood up and motioned for Dua's notepad. I wrote, thirsty, she shook her head, and I wrote, I'm going to grab a soda from upstairs. I need caffeine, her eyes darted to the doorway of the laundry area, then back to me with that same scared look. She reluctantly nodded when I asked if she was okay. As I made my way to the elevator, I glanced into the morgue. I swore I had seen something red earlier, but the room was completely empty. I continued to the elevator and pressed the button. The doors didn't open right away, and I figured someone must have used it, probably the janitor. Finally, the doors opened, and a lady in a red dress greeted me. Her hair was styled in an old-fashioned bun, and she wore a feathered headband and black flats. Her red lipstick matched her dress. I held the door, expecting her to step out, but she just stood there, her eyes on the floor. Are you looking for the ER? I asked. She looked up with a dazed expression and said softly, I think I'm lost. I invited her to come with me to the ER, explaining that nothing else was open in the hospital. She didn't respond, and the elevator started beeping, urging me to make a decision. I stepped in and pressed the button for the main floor. The lights flickered again, and the elevator stopped abruptly. My heart skipped a beat, and my pulse began to rise. I reassured her that the building was old and this sometimes happened, but she remained silent. After what felt like an eternity, the lights came back on and the elevator doors opened to the lobby. I gestured for her to follow me to the ER, but she stayed inside, her gaze still on the floor. The doors began to close and just before they shut, she looked up at me and smirked. I stood there for a moment, my heart pounding. That smirk left me unsettled. I quickly made my way back to the ER and found Dr. Evans slumped over in front of his computer, asleep. Hey Dr. Evans, I said softly, not wanting to startle him. He slowly lifted his head. What's up, he asked, groggily rubbing his eyes. There's a woman in the building who I think needs to be checked on. Either she's messing with me or she needs some serious mental help, I explained. His puzzled expression deepened, but he shrugged. Guess you'll have to go looking for her, he muttered. Maybe radio the janitor and give him a heads up. Yeah, good idea, I said. I grabbed the radio from the nurse's station and called the janitor, but there was no response, which wasn't unusual. I still needed caffeine, so I grabbed a can of Monster from the vending machine. While drinking it, I realized that I hadn't seen anyone else awake or moving. The lady must have gone upstairs in the elevator. I decided to start my search on the second floor. As I headed back to the elevator, I pressed the button and saw that it was coming up from the basement. My stomach tightened. I doubted it was the janitor. It had to be her. I quickly entered the elevator and hit the button for the basement. The lights flickered again and I jerked around to look behind me, nothing was there. My heart raced as I descended. The doors opened and I stepped out, cautiously peeking around the corner. No one was in sight. I moved quietly down the hall, approaching the corner where I had last seen the lady in the red dress. Confidence surged within me, she's just a person messing with us. I'll threaten to call the cops if she doesn't leave, I thought. I approached the corner and peered around. The lady in the red dress stood at the end of the hallway, facing away from me. I slipped the scalpel I had brought with me under the bin in my right hand, just in case. Hey, I called out. If you don't need medical attention, you need to leave, or I'll call the cops my heart was pounding and my palms were sweaty. She didn't move, didn't say a word. 
The silence was deafening. I could hear my own heartbeat. Do you need medical attention? I asked again, trying to keep my voice steady. Slowly, she began to bend over at the waist, her arms dangling lifelessly at her sides. Then she turned towards me. Her eyes were completely white, rolled back into her head. Her jaw hung open impossibly wide, at least a foot toward the ground, and her legs were bent at unnatural angles. Her arms reached towards me, moving back and forth in a grotesque manner. A choking, gargling voice moaned, help me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. My bin of equipment dropped to the floor with a clatter, but I didn't hear it. My hand, trembling, still gripped the scalpel. Suddenly, blood began dripping from her abdomen, spilling onto the floor. Her intestines slowly slid out, dangling from her stomach. She took a small step towards me, her legs cracking with each movement. My back hit the wall behind me. Her jaw hung so low I couldn't see her neck, and her head tilted unnaturally to the side. She coughed, spraying blood across the floor, her voice gurgling as she moaned again. Then her entire body seemed to collapse, her internal organs spilling out onto the ground. I was paralyzed, unable to process what I was seeing. She took another step towards me, her cracked legs swaying as she stumbled forward. She was only a few feet away now. I could see her white, rolled back eyes, her swinging intestines, and the blood pouring out of her abdomen. I was staring straight into the most horrifying thing I had ever seen. She stopped just in front of me, her breath gurgling as blood dripped from her open mouth. Then, suddenly, her eyes snapped forward, locking onto mine. She roared a demonic, deafening sound that shook me to my core. Blood sprayed across my face and everything went black. I woke up in the ER, drenched in sweat and violently shaking. My knees were weak and I was hyperventilating. The scalpel was still in my hand, but now it was covered in blood. I looked around the ER, but no one was in sight. I managed to stand, stumbling towards the nurse's station. Everyone was still slumped over, seemingly asleep, but as I approached, my heart stopped. Their throats had been cut open. Blood was everywhere. I peeked into the physician's hut and saw Dr. Evans, his throat also slashed, blood soaking his chest and lap. His eyes were open, staring lifelessly at me. I gasped and rushed to find Dua. When I entered the room, I froze in horror. She lay on the bed, her arms spread out, her throat cut open. The bed was soaked in blood, and in her hand was her necklace, the cross still gripped tightly. I backed away, unable to comprehend what I was seeing. To my left, in the bay, I saw the janitor lying in a pool of blood his throat also cut open, shaking. I turned on the sink and desperately tried to wash the blood off my hands. It wouldn't come off. I scrubbed harder, using soap, but it stayed. I looked at myself and the mirror blood covered my face, and I had scratches, a black eye, and a busted lip. There had been a struggle. Suddenly, a voice spoke behind me. How did it feel it was a woman's voice? I turned to see Dua sitting up, blood still draining from her throat. You can talk, I choked out. She fell back onto the bed, lifeless. I turned to leave the room and saw her the lady in the red dress. She stood there, back to her normal self, smirking at me. I remember she said, Remember what I managed to ask, barely able to speak. Her grin disappeared, and she looked dead into my eyes. I remember when your ambulance hit me, when it pinned me against that tree. My husband was driving. He hit me on purpose. He wanted me dead. 
It was 1922. The coward waited until our 10-year anniversary to kill me. She stepped closer, her eyes never leaving mine. They brought me to this hospital, to this very ER. Your doctors and nurses, they stood over me as I died. They did nothing. I shook my head, desperate to deny it. I wasn't there. She lunged forward, grabbing my throat, and pushed me against the wall. You did nothing, she hissed. I woke up, rocking back and forth in my bed, my hands ringing together. The psychiatrist sat across from me, patiently waiting. So when are you going to talk about what happened, he asked. It's been two years today, and you haven't said a word. I didn't respond. I hadn't spoken in two years, not since that night. He continued, his voice fading into the background, meaningless to me. You still have a right to live. Even though you were convicted of eight murders, he said gently. A knock came at the door. The psychiatrist opened it, and a voice whispered urgently, it happened again, another mass murder at a hospital. The psychiatrist glanced at me before closing the door and sitting back down. Are you ready to talk, he asked. I took a deep breath and nodded. Slowly, I picked up the pen and clipboard he handed me. I wrote one word and passed it back to him. Devil. The psychiatrist looked at the clipboard. Reading the word I had written devil, his face remained calm, though I saw a flicker of confusion cross his eyes. He placed the clipboard on his lap and leaned forward. What do you mean by devil, he asked, his voice steady, trying to probe deeper. Are you referring to the murders, to the woman in the red dress? I didn't respond. My eyes were fixed on the wall behind him, but my mind was far from this room. I could still hear her voice. I could still feel her hands around my throat. The sensation of blood her blood on my skin had never really left. Listen, he said softly, breaking through the haze of my thoughts. If you don't talk about it, if you don't open up, it's going to stay with you. You'll never be free of this. I turned my gaze to him, my throat tightening. I hadn't spoken a word in two years. What was there to say? No one would believe me. No one could believe me. It wasn't just guilt that kept me silent. It was fear. Fear that speaking it aloud would make it all real again. The psychiatrist sighed and placed the clipboard back on the table. You don't have to say anything today, but when you're ready, I'll be here. Another knock at the door interrupted us. The same voice from earlier spoke again. Dr. Mitchell, we really need you to come. There's been another incident. Dr. Mitchell stood up, giving me one last look before leaving the room. As soon as the door closed, I felt the cold, suffocating weight of silence return. I was alone again. I sat there, rocking slowly, my hands still ringing together. My mind raced with fragmented images of that night, the lady in the red dress, Dua's terrified face, the scalpel in my trembling hand. I squeezed my eyes shut, willing the memories to stop, but they kept coming, relentless. Then, the door creaked open. I froze. My heart pounded in my chest as I slowly opened my eyes. Standing in the doorway was the lady in the red dress. Her hair was still pulled back in that old-fashioned bun, her red lipstick perfectly matching her dress. But her eyes, those white, rolled-back eyes, bore into me. She smiled, the same unsettling smile from the elevator. You can't run from me, she said, her voice soft, yet echoing in the small room. No one can. I blinked, my body shaking uncontrollably. I wanted to scream, to call for help, but my voice was gone stolen, just like it had been two years ago. She took a step forward, her heels clicking softly against the floor. 
I backed up, pressing myself against the cold wall of the room, my hands trembling. How does it feel being trapped in this cycle, she whispered, her smirk widening. It's not over, you know. I'm not done. You can't stop me. Tears welled in my eyes. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. All I could do was watch as she stepped closer, the air in the room growing colder with every inch she gained. Others will suffer. Others will die, just like they did before she stopped right in front of me, leaning in so close that her breath cold and metallic hit my face. And you'll watch it all happen, again and again, just like you did with Dua, just like you did with the others. I shut my eyes tightly, willing her to disappear, praying for this nightmare to end. But when I opened them again, she was still there, her face inches from mine. I'll be seeing you again, she whispered, before stepping back and fading into the shadows of the room. The door closed with a soft click, and I was alone once more. The psychiatrist returned a few minutes later, his face pale and his expression tight. It happened again, he said, sitting down across from me. Another hospital, same circumstances, multiple people dead. He looked at me, waiting for a reaction. I remained silent, staring blankly at the floor. Do you know anything about this? He asked carefully. I didn't answer. I couldn't. I had no answers, only fear. Fear of the devil in the red dress. Fear of the cycle repeating itself. Fear of what she had done to me and what she would continue to do to others. The psychiatrist waited a moment longer before shaking his head and standing up. We'll continue this another day. As he left the room, I picked up the clipboard he had left behind. My hands trembled as I wrote one last word. Cycle. I stared at the word, knowing deep down that this wasn't the end. The lady in the red dress would be back. She always came back. And next time, it wouldn't just be me she was after. After the psychiatrist left the room, I sat there in silence, the word cycle still glaring back at me from the clipboard. My hands trembled. The events of that night, the blood, the horror, the screams flooded my mind. The lady in the red dress would never leave me. She would never stop. The cycle would continue, and I didn't know how to break it. I felt trapped, just like the others had been. Dua, Dr. Evans, the janitor, my co-workers, none of them had been able to escape her. And neither would I. Suddenly I heard footsteps outside the room. My heart began to race again, and I instinctively glanced at the door, half expecting her to walk back in, wearing that sinister grin. But it wasn't her. Instead, it was the psychiatrist again. He stepped in, holding a file in his hand, his face more serious than before. He sat down across from me, his eyes scanning the room before locking onto mine. Something strange has happened, he said, his voice low. You said something earlier. You mentioned a cycle. What did you mean by that? I stayed quiet, unable to form words. The weight of my guilt and fear pressed down on me, suffocating me from the inside. He waited for me to answer, but I couldn't. My throat felt as though it had been tied shut. The thing is, he continued. Flipping open the file, we looked into the details of this recent incident. You're not going to believe this, but the woman described. He stopped. Staring at me intently, she fits the exact description of a patient who died in this hospital nearly 100 years ago. A woman in a red dress. My stomach dropped. It felt as though the ground had been ripped out from under me. She wasn't just a ghost. She was real. We did some digging. He continued, And it turns out this woman... Her name was Annabelle Porter. She was admitted to this hospital after an accident. An ambulance brought her here after her husband purposely ran her down with their car. 
She died of massive injuries, her abdomen was torn open, and she bled out in the ER. The records say she wasn't given proper care. It was well he paused, hesitating before finishing, they said it was negligence. I swallowed hard, my mind spinning. Annabelle Porter, the lady in the red dress, had a name. And here's where it gets stranger, the psychiatrist said, leaning forward. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. Over the years, several incidents, mass murders, like the one you witnessed have occurred in hospitals. Always the same story, a woman in a red dress is seen roaming the halls before the killings. The weight of his words sank in. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just this hospital. Annabelle Porter had been haunting hospitals for years, repeating her cycle of vengeance, and I had been a part of it. Do you understand now, he asked, his voice gentle. Whatever this is, it's not over. I nodded slowly, unable to speak. I had no doubt in my mind that Annabelle Porter wasn't done. She would continue, and there was nothing I could do to stop her. She was angry, furious, and her thirst for revenge was unquenchable. The psychiatrist closed the file and stood up. I'll be back tomorrow. I think it's important we talk more about this. As he left the room, I stared at the closed door, dread washing over me. The cycle would repeat. It always did. That night I lay in my bed, wide awake. The shadows in the corners of the room seemed darker than usual, and the silence was oppressive. My heart pounded in my chest, and every little sound made me jump. I knew she was still out there waiting. And then, in the quiet of the night, I heard it the soft clicking of heels. It echoed faintly, growing louder with each step. My breath hitched in my throat as the sound neared my door. I didn't dare move, my body frozen in fear. The door creaked open slowly, and there she was Annabelle Porter, the lady in the red dress. She stood in the doorway, her white, rolled back eyes fixed on me, her lips curling into that same unnerving smile. She didn't say a word, but I knew what she was thinking. The cycle wasn't over. It would never be over. And as she stepped closer, I realized this time, she wasn't going to leave me behind. The events described here were removed from the records of the building known as Evenwood Hospital. This document is meant to perhaps shed some light on the supposedly paranormal occurrences found within the establishment that led to its sudden closing. If you find this document in your possession and decide to read it, be warned those behind the tragedy have not yet been brought to justice, nor has a scientific explanation been found for the more supernatural elements. Nobody has stepped forward claiming to be the sketch man the person or creature stated to be responsible. As such, this contains the facts and only the facts. Even Wood Hospital was built in the town of a wood, Massachusetts, during the colonial era by Joseph Price, a wealthy businessman. It was operated by Price's family for many generations until it was bought by Immer Vant, a wealthy German doctor looking for a solo business opportunity. Immer ran the hospital for five years without incident, and the people of the town considered him an upstanding citizen, the kind of person for whom nothing could go wrong. Surely, people like Emer would always find a way to survive. It was on the anniversary of his sixth year living in the town of Evenwood that everything changed. Vint was holding an annual gala at his house to celebrate six successful years of business. He, his wife Anna, and his daughter Kaya lived in a large home near the hospital. The years had been good to them. It was one of Evenwood's most expensive houses. The guests for the gala began to arrive around seven, and the family was there to greet them. Anna was considered a great beauty with golden hair and blue eyes. 
Kaya took after her father, a wiry brunette with shrewd green eyes and glasses. Both were considered the perfect family for the doctor. The gala was a large public affair, and the house was filled with guests. Dr. Vance's colleagues had all been invited and stood in a corner talking with him until well past 7.45. Anna was sitting in the parlor, entertaining the female guests from 7.15 to 8.05 when it was time for the food to be served. Kaya, meanwhile, had wandered off. Nobody saw her from 7.30 to 8, although one guest fainted, claiming she had heard the little girl screaming in pain from the upstairs conservatory, which had been boarded up for years. Immer opened the conservatory, but Kaya was not inside. However, the window was open and the wind was blowing in, although the room had not been touched for years. It was presumed that she had gone into the hospital to explore. When she returned, she carried with her a surprisingly accurate drawing of herself and looked distant. Her parents had been occupied during this time, and none of the guests had given this to her. When asked, she said that the picture was a gift from the sketch man. Anna and Amor simply laughed at her. Lately, Kaya had been constantly talking about an imaginary friend she called the sketch man. She said he lived in an old room in the hospital, drew things for her, and didn't like being ignored. When her parents insisted that there was no such person in the hospital, Kaya threw a tantrum saying that the sketch man didn't like to be ignored. She said he had a dark red leather bound sketchbook where he drew people who ignored him. Those people, she claimed, would disappear. Anna and Emer believed she had read one of those awful penny dreadfuls and sent her to bed without dinner. That night, Kaya settled down and tearfully admitted that she had made up the story to scare her parents. Listening to her bring it up again, they believed it was a desperate bid for attention and let her be. The gala ran until 10 p.m. around that time. Kaya disappeared yet again. Her parents waved goodbye to their guests, then set about searching for their daughter. She had an uncanny habit of wandering off and disappearing for hours on end. They checked the house from top to bottom, including the attic and the basement, which had been locked she was nowhere to be found. Thinking she must have gone outside, Dr. Vant lit a lantern and set out to look for Kaya on the property. By now it was about 10.45. She wasn't anywhere near the house, so Emer turned to the woods. He was searching through the trees, calling his daughter's name when his servant found him at 11. The servant was Vincent Kelly, the butler. In a vague account from Emer, he noted that something about Vincent had seemed odd that night. He appeared taller, and his uniform was stained with a substance believed to be artist's ink. Also, Vincent's normally well-groomed black hair was wildly disheveled. Dr. Vant assumed the man had been drinking and resolved to dock his pay for it. The butler relayed the message that Kaya had been found in her room, fast asleep, at 10.55. Emer was mildly confused, as he was almost sure he and Anna had looked in that room first. Kaya had not been there when they checked, only a drawing of her. Shaking his head, he muttered about the late hour and retired to bed at 11.06. The next morning, Emer Vant awoke and left promptly for work at 6. Anna woke shortly after, at 6.15, and ordered the servants to prepare breakfast for her and Kaya. Breakfast was served at 6.20, which was around the time Kaya woke. As they ate, a letter was delivered to the house. It was addressed to Amur and contained a letter from Beatrix Kille, Vincent's wife. Vincent had been found dead at 10.20 the previous evening after a game of cards had taken a nasty turn. His opponents caught him cheating and exacted revenge by lynching him. Anna was confused by this message. As Amor had returned to the house with Vincent at 11.03 p.m., she clearly remembered seeing him, although something had seemed different. Anna decided to visit her husband at the hospital, 
as the letter made her feel uneasy. She told the servants to look after Kaya, who was nowhere to be seen and had presumably disappeared again. When Anna left, it was seven. She arrived at the hospital two minutes later, at 7.02, and went inside immediately to look for Amer, her uneasiness growing into fear. Inside, she tried in vain to compose herself, thinking there had to be a logical explanation for the mystery unfolding in front of her. The servant she had seen must have been somebody else, not Vincent, after all. She walked the halls calling for Emer. The hospital was surprisingly empty, although Anna could hear the sounds of patients moaning and doctors bustling about. She never saw a single one. Every last sheet was ink-stained and free of any inhabitants. As she was leaving one hallway, she heard her husband call back, although his voice sounded muffled and far away, like he was speaking through a gag. At that time, it was 7.09. Anna entered the ward he had been in, which was numbered 522. The door slammed shut behind her, and a patient later claimed to have heard her screaming, then saw blood seeping from under the door, intermingling with black ink. However, that was not possible, as the hospital did not have a Ward 522, and the fifth floor was a storage area for old equipment. The door to the stairs leading to this floor, according to the janitor, had been locked up tight. Back at home, Kaya had vanished yet again. This time, the servants could not locate her until they found her lying unconscious in the conservatory at 8 p.m. Emer had relocked the conservatory after searching it the previous night, yet the servants found the doors standing open when they went to look for Kaya. At first, they believed she was asleep, exhausted from the previous night. They carried her to bed at 8.04 and left her to lie until 9.00. When the servants checked on her again, she still had not woken and seemed to be running a fever. Kaya didn't respond to touch, sound, or smelling salts. The servants decided to send someone to the hospital to alert Dr. Vent of his daughter's illness, a strange, wild-haired footman who none of the staff knew but all swore was employed at the house, volunteered. He set off at 9.05 and arrived at the hospital around 9.07. He found Emer at 9.09 and relayed the news. Emer immediately returned to the house, arriving there at 9.11. The footman left Emer at this point and was never seen again by any other member of the staff. Dr. Vent then rushed to Kaya's room. To his surprise and fear, he found the door locked from the inside. He could hear Kaya moaning and crying out in pain. The cries were occasionally broken by her muttering the words, the sketch man has many faces. He's here with you right now repeatedly. Jerking at the knob in panic, he called out for the servants to bring a key. The key was found at 9.20. By that time, Kaya's father was at his wit's end. He grabbed the key like a madman and forced open the door. Kaya was sitting up in bed, apparently fine. The only odd feature was that her brunette hair had turned stark white, and the room was filled with hasty drawings of wild, terrifying figures. The servants were confused by her quick recovery and the sudden appearance of the artwork. When they questioned her, Kaya told them that the sketch man had made her better with magic. Emer, his professional mask slipping, immediately declared that Kaya's fever was the result of a particularly vivid dream. As it is known that there are some things science cannot explain, those reading this document are urged to remember that there are times when we do not know how or why we encounter strange things. At this point, Dr. Vent began documenting his daughter's symptoms, mental state, and recovery more closely. That was the first night. 